Hey there, folks, and welcome back. Since beginning our lessons on vector calculus, we've focused very heavily on integration, line integrals, the fundamental theorem, Green's theorem, but we've said very little about derivatives of vector fields. Well, today we're going to start. It turns out there are a couple important derivative operations that one can perform on a vector field f, and those will reveal certain physical properties of the vector field. The first derivative-like object that we're going to discuss is called the curl of a vector field f. We define this for vector fields in R3, so they have three components, p, q, and r, and it's itself another vector field. The curl of the function is given by this vector field. We take the partial of r with respect to y minus the partial of q with respect to z times i hat, so that's the first entry, partial p by partial z minus partial r by partial x times j hat, that's the second entry, and finally, partial q by partial x minus partial p by partial y k vector. That's the third entry. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Come on, Zach, do you actually expect me to memorize this? No, I don't even memorize it. It turns out we have a really nice way of thinking about the curl that requires no memorization. We're going to define this operator, which we call del or nabla. It's a vector that consists of our derivative operators, partial by partial x, partial by partial y, and partial by partial z. They're the derivatives, but we haven't yet applied them to a particular function. It turns out that this nasty curl function is really the cross product, the vector cross product, of this vector of partial derivatives and our vector field f. If you'll recall, we often think of the cross product like the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. We put our standard basis vectors i, j, k in the first row. We put our first vector in the second row, so that's our del operator. And finally, in the bottom row, we put our other vector, p, q, r. So this is how I remember the curl, much, much easier. Let's try an example so you see how this works. For our first example, we're going to determine the curl of this vector field. f of x, y, z equals x, y, e to the x, y plus z. All we have to remember is that the curl is the cross product of our derivative operator and our vector field. So we can think of this as the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix i, j, k in the top row. In the second row, we put our derivatives partial by partial x, partial by partial y, partial by partial z. And in the third row, we put our three component functions x, y, e to the x, y plus z. Now we expand as normal. We'll expand about the top row. We get i hat times the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix in this corner, which is partial by partial y, partial by partial z, e to the x, y plus z. Next, we subtract j hat times the determinant of partial by partial x, x, y, partial by partial z, y plus z. And finally, we add k hat times the determinant of partial by partial x, x, y, partial by partial y, e to the x. We'll evaluate the remaining determinants just like we normally would with 2 by 2 matrices. We combine the cross terms and we take the difference. Except now, we're not really multiplying because this isn't really a number. We're applying a derivative operation to the term across from it. So you can see here, we're going to apply partial by partial y to y plus z. That will give us 1. And we subtract partial by partial z applied to e to the x, but that's 0. So we simply have i hat for our first term. In the second matrix, we have partial by partial x applied to y plus z. That's 0. Minus partial by partial z applied to x, y. That's also 0. This j term just goes away. Finally, partial by partial x applied to e to the x, that's e to the x, minus partial by partial y applied to x, y, that's simply x. So we have e to the x minus x times k hat. And there you go. This is our new vector field. The curl of f is given by 1, 0, e to the x minus x. Now you might be wondering, what about vector fields with only two components, vector fields from R2 to R2? Can we compute the curl of these vector fields? Yes, we can, but we have to be a little bit careful. 
Remember, the cross product operation is something that we can only do in R3. It's not defined in R2. So we have to be sneaky here. We are going to define the curl of this vector field on R2 to be the curl of this vector field on R3. We're going to treat it like a vector field on R3 with nothing going on in the Z component. So we can compute the curl using our determinant formula. We put in P, Q, 0 for the last row and compute as normal. Notice that when I compute my first term, i hat times the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix, I'm going to get partial by partial y of 0, well that's 0, minus partial by partial z of q. q only depends on x and y, so that derivative is 0 as well. My i hat term goes away. Similarly, when I compute my j hat term, I'm going to have partial by partial x of 0, again that's 0, minus partial by partial z of p, that's also 0. p doesn't depend on z. So both i hat and j hat disappear. This simply leaves me with k hat times the determinant of partial by partial x applied to q minus partial by partial y applied to p. The curl of my vector field is partial q by partial x minus partial p by partial y k hat. Now does this term look familiar? Hopefully it does. These are exactly the derivatives that appeared in Green's theorem. These are exactly the derivatives that we considered in our component test. So we've been working with the curl all along. We just didn't know it. In particular, we can rephrase our component test in terms of the curl of f. Remember, the component test tells us that if a vector field is conservative, then partial p by partial y must be equal to partial q by partial x. That is, the curl of our vector field is zero. So conservative vector fields must have zero curl. Pretty cool, huh? Well, we also have a converse to the component test. The converse says if our two partial derivatives are equal and the domain of f is simply connected, then f is conservative. Well, if we rephrase that in terms of curl, we're saying if the curl is equal to zero and the domain is simply connected, then f is conservative. So you can see we can use the curl to test whether or not our vector field is conservative. Now all of this was in the context of vector fields in R2, but it turns out the connection holds for vector fields in R3 as well. Let's record this on the next slide. Okay, here's a summary of what we've just discussed. Really, it's the component test rephrased in terms of curl. It gives us an efficient way to decide whether or not a vector field is conservative. So here's the setup. We start with a vector field f on R2 or R3. And that vector field is going to have component functions with continuous second order partial derivatives. This is not a big deal. Usually our partial derivatives will be continuous everywhere. So the first statement is, if our vector field is conservative, it must have zero curl. Conversely, if the curl is zero and our domain is simply connected, it's connected and has no holes, then our vector field is conservative. The big advantage to this result is that it includes vector fields on R3, whereas our component test, at least how we phrased it, only included vector fields on R2. So now, by checking the curl of our vector field, we have a nice, efficient way of determining whether or not a vector field in R3 is conservative. Pretty nice, huh? As a quick application, the vector field in our first example had non-zero curl. Therefore, it's not conservative. I'd like to end this video by giving you some intuition as to what the curl of a vector field really represents. As you may have guessed from the name, it tells us something about rotations. So let's pretend that we have a vector field on R2. We can represent it using a series of arrows plotted in the xy plane. We have an arrow at every point in the domain xy. It turns out that the best way to think about the curl is to pretend that these vector fields represent some type of a fluid flow. Maybe we have water rushing down a river, and at a point x, y, this arrow tells us our velocity. The curl of f also depends on x and y. We saw earlier that the curl is some function of x and y times k vector. The value of this function at x, y tells us how much rotation occurs if we place a small object in our river at that point. So for example, let's look at this river on the left. If I place an object in this river, really at any point, but let's say here in particular, 
you can see that the river is going to move it forward. It's going to push it to the right, but it's not going to cause the object to rotate, right? We have the same forces acting on the object here as we do down here. So the object moves forward, but it doesn't turn. Therefore, the curl is zero. If instead I place that same object in the river on the right, something very different will happen. If I place the object, say, up here, well, it's still going to move forward, right? The river is pushing it to the right, but I have more of a force acting on the object from the top than I do from the bottom. So the object is actually going to rotate clockwise. If it rotates clockwise, well, it's rotating in the negative direction. This function is going to give us a negative value. If instead I place that same object down here, well, now there's a greater force pushing the object from the bottom, causing it to rotate counterclockwise. Since our object is rotating in the positive direction, this function is going to give us a positive value. So the takeaway is that the curl represents the amount of rotation caused by our vector field at the point x, y.